Now I will turn it to over to our first speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Sayyad Basharat Mehdi. Dr. Mehdi is consultant chest physician and first lung cancer lead, Lankasar Teaching Hospital at Princeton, UK. He has the postgraduate diploma in medical education from University of Manchester. He is passionate about medical teaching. He is going to talk about the plot in COVID. What do we know? With that, I ask that you give your full attention to Dr. Mehdi and help me in welcoming him, Dr. Sayyad Basharat Mehdi. Hi, Dr. Mehdi. Thank you, Dr. Riaz. Let me just bring up my screen and I'll start sharing it. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. And am I audible? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Riaz. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to be presenting in uh, such a international conference and thanks Dr. Raza for organizing it. Um, I'm one of the chess physicians here at uh, Lancashire Teaching Hospital and I'm uh, also the trust lung cancer lead. I have a passion towards uh, clots and COVID, which is why I thought it's best if I can speak on this topic. My topic is clots and COVID. What do we know? I'll run through the slides. Um, there is about you know, 15 minutes to go through this. At the end of it, at the end of the conference, we can have a discussion around various aspects. So moving on, if I can uh, move to the next slide, which is structure of my talk. I thought I'll just brief, briefly tell you what the structure is. I'm gonna give a little bit of introduction, a bit of a pathophysiology, a bit of management, what local protocols we have developed, audit data and some summary of my slides. So if I can move to the next slide, which is introduction. Very clear, COVID itself is a pandemic. And unfortunately, the risk of clot development in COVID is a significant mortality indicator. We know there is micro and macro thromboembolic disease in COVID. Unfortunately, COVID is itself is a high mortality uh, disease, but association with clots makes it even more higher. We also know that COVID associated with severe illness of uh, clots. We have a lot of observational studies, but more importantly, some autopsy studies, which has confirmed that there is not only micro, but also deep vein and pulmonary embolism in COVID. We very well know that anybody who develops a clot on its own is a very poor prognostic marker, but in association with COVID, unfortunately, it is not a very good uh, uh, outcome. What we also know, just in terms of the pathophysiology, some of you may already know, we know COVID is a viral infection. It potentially triggers what we call as the virtuous triad. We've learned this in our physiology days. This is a complement mediated endothelial injury. So it is IL-6 mediated. When there is a cell injury in the vessels, there's inflammatory response. When there is inflammatory response, there is tendency to clot. Most of our COVID patients are breathless and therefore they are immobile or less mobile that itself is a risk factor for clot formation. Hypoxemia in these COVID patients is a risk factor for clot formation. So there's plenty of reasons why unfortunately COVID patients are at a higher risk of clot formation. We know on its own, it's again a hypercoagulable state because there is increased prothrombotic factors. There's elevated factor eight, elevated fibrinogen, and hyperviscosity of the blood, which leads to thrombus formation. We all know we do certain set of investigations for COVID. I'm sure you know we do full blood count, but it's important that we make sure we do clotting profile in these patients. Apart from use and ease and CRP, which are infection markers, also renal function, it is imperative and useful to make sure we do some other blood tests such as D-dimer, troponin, and BNP. 
Now, in our hospital, we do what we call as the procalcitonin. This is something that helps us to decide stepping up antibiotic therapy or starting antibiotic therapy or stepping down antibiotic therapy. So it's a very good marker to guide us whether there is super added blood uh, bacterial infection. We came up with a simple term as a COVID blood test bundle where anybody who comes in with suspected or confirmed COVID can have these set of bloods. Of course, chest X-ray is extremely important and COVID swab to confirm whether somebody has infection is part of the investigations. Now, having done that, I'm sure most of us come across a high D-dimer result. D-dimer on its own, unfortunately, is not a very sensitive marker because it can reflect a variety of things. We know this from our day-to-day -day practice, even before COVID, in terms of D doing, doing D-dimers, because it means you're either looking for a clot or somebody has renal impairment or somebody has a trauma or a hematoma. All these conditions can give you high D-dimer. But in terms of COVID, why is it relevant? D-dimer on its own in COVID can just reflect inflammation or the infection process. However, it also strongly correlates with the severity of the illness, meaning somebody who has a COVID and D-dimer, unfortunately, is one of the markers of the severity. It is likely to be positive in almost all of the acutely ill COVID patients. And it's very likely that it is going to be positive in severe COVID infection. As I said, it's a prognostic marker, not just from the infection point of view, but also a guide for the level of care. Now, if this is linked to lymphopenia or troponin or to the chest X-ray changes, it might just help us decide that this gentleman with COVID or this patient with COVID is likely to get worse. Therefore, it is extremely important to make sure we do um, uh, all these blood tests. Moving on, um, in terms of ICU itself, the reason I say that is because we've seen in our cohort of patients that there is predominantly all the ICU patients have had high D-dimer. Now, unfortunately, by the time people learned from COVID, there was significant mortality associated with it. I think it's a learning curve. We have not seen so many new things that we've learned from COVID. In ICU, I think the risk of venous thromboembolism is higher anyway, but it is markedly increased if somebody has D-dimer and COVID. What we also know is there is higher prevalence of VTE in patients who, in fact, even though they receive prophylactic dose, they still have high incidence of venous thromboembolism. There's also increased association of pulmonary microvascular thrombosis in these patients, and if you extrapolate all this, there is increased mortality. We'd started doing this as a routine test, but we also had a hypothesis whether repeating D-dimer is a good idea. I think on a daily basis or less frequently, uh, guided by few things, I think it is useful. One, it tells you whether the patient is improving or it gives you a little bit of acuity of the patient illness itself. The initial D-dimer results, we've seen D-dimer results excessively high as opposed to pre-COVID era. It also gives you an indication, depending on the trajectory of the value of the D-dimer as to how severe the patient is. Now, elevated D-dimer at admission and markedly increasing D-dimer levels almost three to four fold is associated with, as I said, very high mortality. It is associated with coagulation activation from infection itself and the cytokine storm that we've talked about during this COVID, and unfortunately, multi-organ failure. Once you've done the D-dimer, of course, we want to diagnose whether somebody has clot or not. Now, we know the best or the gold standard test for diagnosing pulmonary embolism is CTPA, which is CT pulmonary angiogram. And for DVT, it's generally the ultrasound leg. But there are some challenges here. As you know, most COVID patients are breathless patients. 
getting a CTPA or a CT scan in these breathless patients is extremely challenging because the quality of the scans can be suboptimal. It cannot completely rule out microthrombi. So sometimes the CTPA may not make us any wiser. More importantly, we will be reaching an increased demand on the scans, increased radiation. Therefore, we have to be very careful about selecting the patients. However, that does not mean that we don't suspect, but we still need to be careful about it. So what can we do? I think it's important that we have an algorithmic or a very clear protocol of what we do for these patients with COVID and suspected PEs or suspected clots. So it's important to not only determine the severity illness, but also manage the venous thromboembolism. It is important that we develop local or institutional protocols for prophylaxis in COVID. And of course, hematology input is extremely useful in these patients. It is also important to bear in mind that most of the anticoagulants have a risk of bleeding. So it's not just anticoagulating them, but also keeping in mind the risk of thrombosis. What we also need to be careful is these D-dimer or the anticoagulation has to be borne in mind in terms of some renal patients where we have to be extremely careful. I'll come on to that in my future slides. This is the protocol we developed locally in our trust. So if we have somebody who we suspect or confirmed COVID, what we do then is we generally look at criteria such as supplemental oxygen requirement. If their D-dimer is high, now this value may vary from trust to trust, hospital to hospital. If there is worsening of clinical condition and if there is need for ICU admission, any of these criteria, we class them as high risk and therefore we would give them high prophylactic dose, not the treatment dose, but high prophylactic dose. If they worsen in terms of clinical or increased clinical suspicion of pulmonary embolism or increasing or decrease disproportionate oxygen demand, then of course we strongly suspect P and then we move on to treatment dose in oxaparin or treatment dose low molecular weight heparin. If they are not in this category, which is confirmed or suspected, but not confirmed or not suspected, then we go with the standard prophylactic dose. So there's three different doses. One is a standard prophylactic dose. There's a high prophylactic dose and there's a treatment dose. So there's three different doses of uh, low molecular weight heparin. In terms of anticoagulants, we have, I'm sure you know this, we have different anticoagulants in terms of injection form, which is Fragment, there's Daltiparin, there's Inoxaparin, there's Clexane, there's Tinzaparin, and we have some newer or direct oral anticoagulants. So we have the liberty of using some of these in COVID situations. Interestingly, and some of you probably know this, Low molecular weight heparin is not only an anticoagulant, but also has an anti-inflammatory effect as well, which is quite useful in situations like COVID. I was reading very briefly, there is possible animal model of antiviral effect, but that's very, very new and there's not much evidence for COVID. Now, in terms of the dosing regime, of course, this is a busy slide. But what I would probably stress upon is people who are of say 50 to 100 kilograms of weight, which is majority of the population, we use prophylactic dose of 5,000 units subcutaneously once daily as your prophylactic dose in non-COVID. However, in patients who we think we are strongly suspecting COVID or who have COVID, we strongly recommend 5,000 units subcutaneously but twice daily. So that is the difference between uh, a prophylactic and a high prophylactic dose. Of course, for renal patients, like I was saying, we use enoxaparin with constant monitoring of anti-10A levels to ensure that they do not end up with bleeding. In terms of prophylaxis, 
uh, as I said, we have a standard prophylaxis and we have intermediate or high dose prophylaxis. And I've already elucidated, illust illustrated the criteria, which is our local criteria. If somebody needs supplemental oxygen, if somebody has high D dimer, somebody has a worsening clinical condition or ICU admission, they are sufficient criteria to ensure that they are properly anticoagulated. In terms of treatment dose for suspected, yes. If you strongly suspect P, yes, we have to go with making sure they are on the uh, treatment dose of uh, low molecular weight heparin. What happens after? So this is another important thing because once the patients have been treated and they are about to go home, we have a policy where we've developed this and there is a lot of guidance on this, not only locally, but also from the, uh, our local society, which is the British Thoracic Society. And there's very clear guidelines. The guidelines are free for downloading. You can use it for your day-to-day -day, uh, practice as well. What we do is we make sure we gain the consent of the patient and the next of kin to make sure they understand the rationale behind giving them the prophylactic dose of fragment because the hypercoagulable state is gonna be persistent for some time. We train them on administration of uh, low molecular weight heparin or the carer. We make sure they're educated, counseled, and provided with some safety netting in terms of bleeding risks. We also make sure we communicate this to their primary care physician in terms of a discharge letter. So we prescribe about four weeks of low molecular weight heparin in the prophylactic dose on discharge. That's our local policy. I thought it's a good idea to just show some anecdotal evidence and maybe some real life experience of using this kind of uh, data where we can show you what we have done locally in our hospital. So we did, we have, this is an ongoing audit, but we have done a short survey audit of about 28 patients who were admitted with COVID, out of which majority of them, as you can see, 23 out of 28 patients had D-dimer done on admission. It's a fairly routine practice in UK to do D-dimer in somebody who comes in with breathlessness and suspicion of DVT or P but also in somebody who has got COVID. Out of these, there's about 12 patients who actually had serial D-dimers. You know, when I was talking about doing D-dimers on a repeated basis, we had about 50, close to 50% patients who had serial D-dimers done. And out of those, there's about 11 of them who had further increase in D-dimer, further reinforcing the fact that the inflammatory response is ongoing. Now, Again, I, I won't bet on this data, but what I have, what we have seen in our data is almost percent of the above 28 patients who had high D-dimer needed some sort of respiratory support. And they actually, in our hospital, they needed uh, CPAP as um, further respiratory support. So indirectly, what I'm trying to say is D-dimer will not only help you to diagnose or suspect P, but please a little bit of prognostic marker. I'm sure Dr. Raza will touch upon this, but I thought I'll just highlight troponin with D and procalcitonin, they all link in. That is why I was trying to say it's extremely crucial that we ensure that we do this bundle to help prognosticate our patients. In summary, we know there is significant incidence of VTE in our COVID patients. We also know that the risk stratification of COVID patients is extremely crucial in deciding whether this is purely COVID or there is an associated pathology, especially around thromboembolic disease. We've got to have a low threshold for suspecting venous thromboembolic disease in COVID patients. It is extremely important that we all have some sort of local management protocols in dealing with this. I think we're learning day by day, and therefore it is important, it's never too late to have this kind of protocol and algorithm way of dealing with things. Most importantly, I think data collection is crucial because it is here to stay and it will be extremely useful 
for our future reference. With that, I would like to thank the organizers and the moderator for giving me the chance to present my uh, talk on COVID and clots. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Mehran. Now I'm going to invite our third speaker, Dr. Mehran Javed. Dr. Javed is consultant, old secretary, Sir Salford, Greater Manchester, UK. is clinical lead for memory services and care homes in his locality. Part of clinical senate for Greater Manchester, Lancashire and the South Cumbria. Co-founder of the Metox online vehicle to spread and inform the general public to health and well-being. He's going to talk about the impact on mental health. Dr. Mehran Javed. Hi, Dr. Javed. Hello. Hi. Hi, Riaz. Uh, hello to everyone. Thank you for uh, inviting me to talk about this important topic. Um, obviously, coronavirus and the impact on mental health, but at the same time, we have to recognize that there is no health without mental health. So this is quite a dynamic area, but I will try to um, uh, contain as much uh, as some of the data that has already existed on this, uh, on this topic. So the content of my presentation will include some of the data. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Uh, Saad Basharat has already made reference uh, to some of this data, but it's just kind of a quick revisiting um, of that. Uh, I think we need to understand the state of affairs before COVID-19 and, and what history has actually taught us. Um, and then from that, we can focus a bit more on, on mental health difficulties how to optimize your own mental health, as well as the challenges ahead. So I guess some of the, um, some of the additional caveats is that I am an all-day psychiatrist that works in the UK. Uh, I, I also am a Senate member for Greater Manchester, Lancashire and South Cumbria, as well as co-founder of MedTalks. Um, so this is the visual data by World Health Organization. This was as of 5th of May, 2020. Um, and I know Dr. Saad Ahmed had made some references to the chronological events that took place, but clearly you can see from March onwards, there was a, um, a steep escalation of, uh, of difficulties, namely in Europe, but then uh, unfortunately being uh, superseded by uh, United States of America. So from my perspective in the UK itself, and this is data that I've obtained by um, uh, searching the Office uh, of National Statistics as well as Mental Health Foundation, there are some, some key uh, societal issues um, that need increased attention. One in three people are concerned about losing their jobs. One in five people who are unemployed in the UK have unfortunately had suicidal thoughts. And when we think around the dis distribution of coronavirus, uh, I think initially there's a lot of focus around London, uh, but has since then has spread to other aspects of, of the country, uh, as well as the um, uh, deaths uh, related to it. But also putting in, into context the lockdown implications, as well as the financial impact, will intensify inequalities. We are all aware of health inequalities that exist in health, but there's also inequalities that exist in education um, as well as um, affluence. So all these kind of factors will have an effect on mental health. And unfortunately, it tends to have a more negative effect. If we think about debt in itself, we can uh, make reference to data stating that one in four people who are in debt have a mental health problem. So deprivation is also a key area for greater understanding. Um, as the degree of deprivation increases, so does the difficulties. And unfortunately, this also equates to the number of deaths. You can see that in the most deprived areas, there's at least twice, if not more, the number of deaths as compared to the least deprived areas um, in the United Kingdom. So when we take a step back, these, these are issues that have been present before. Unfortunately, they're going to be present tomorrow and the years to come. But it's up to us to influence and tackle these so that the unfortunate consequences of um, coronavirus and associated uh, illnesses uh, is controlled in a, uh, in a more fair, just and appropriate manner. So when we think about inequalities, I made some reference to socioeconomic difficulties, poverty, unemployment, 
food insecurity uh, as well as physical activity are clear areas and factors that unfortunately have a negative influence on um, uh, coronavirus in the sense of uh, being susceptible as well as uh, recovery from it. We do know that healthcare workers, carers, offenders, refugees, older people, and those people in residential settings are greatest at risk. And unfortunately, there's now greater amounts of data on ethnicity um, that putting all the factors to one side, it appears that uh, people of a British, um, uh, sorry, black, uh, Asian, and other ethnic minorities are at least twice as susceptible uh, to be impacted by coronavirus. So when we think around pre-COVID, this is before uh, things took place uh, as of 2020. We know there appears to be a pandemic within a pandemic. So mental health problems appear to be rising. 25% of Idaho has mental health difficulties, which is a profound number. Um, but we also are seeing greater degree of negative influence uh, on the youth aged between 12 and 17. 13% appear to be suffering from major depression and um, we have to think about what other things may be impacting that, whether it's around social media um, uh, or other expectations. I did struggle um, to get more recent data on Bahrain. So this is probably a little bit dated, but nevertheless, it does highlight that around 20% had lifetime depression, but the more concerning thing is around 60% did not receive treatment. And this is whether it's a pharmacological or a non-pharmacological method of managing it. Uh, and nearly 1 billion have mental health disorder. Unfortunately, dementia appears to be the fastest growing. And this is uh, um, with reference to uh, the Lancet um, publication. So some of the references are already included for people to, to uh, read further on. Coming closer to home, European Union, when we think around the amount of expenditure on mental health, UK doesn't appear to be too different. So across the uh, European Union, around 4% uh, of the gross domestic product appears to be spent on mental health, which equates to around 600 billion euros. Uh, this is a staggering amount, um, but it just shows you the, the task at hand. More than one in six people appear to have a mental health problem in any year. Uh, and we have to reflect and think around how do we actually get the promotion programs? How do we target the vulnerable groups? Because a lot of the, um, a lot of the programs don't appear to target more specifically to unemployed uh, or those of immigrant or refugee status or especially older people. So health authorities took a more direct approach. Their, their view was around prevention and containment, which is perfectly reasonable and right. So a lot of the guidance is around social distancing. There's uh, lots of literature out there, which is open to debate. But I guess I'm trying to uh, highlight the, what the necessary steps were taken. So hand hygiene, quarantine were, were other uh, mechanisms to try and contain further spread. But there was also a need to address public stigma. So um, branding a certain ethnic group, uh, making them responsible for something like this um, is something that should not be tolerated in any society. Um, and we have to encourage others to seek help in a safe manner. So suffering in silence is not the way forward and this is what we've learned since especially in in the UK as the lockdown went in force from around March the 23rd. There appeared to be lack of emphasis on the impact of mental health and this is more of a global um, kind of oversight so uh, so clearly mental health was an issue as it was an issue before but there appeared to be some lack in direction. If you think around the SARS virus, so that's the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome that took place in 2002. Um, there were only less than uh, 8,500 cases, but with a mortality rate of around 9.5%. The Middle East Respiratory Syndrome of 2012 had cases just over 2,500, 
uh, but with the much higher mortality rate of 34%. Obviously, the cases in coronavirus is much higher and staggeringly high, uh, but the mortality rate is much lower. And we still need to further understand what, uh, why this is the case. So when we think around psychiatric and neuropsychiatric presentations, there was a good paper that looked at 72 independent studies, um, but the number of subjects appeared to uh, overlap the more studies they looked at. So the minimum number of subjects within, within this systematic review um, included uh, just under 3,600. Confusion or delirium, which is an acute confusional state, um, was around 28%, and this is in the acute phase. But on further review and further follow-up, at one year, uh, unfortunately, 29% showed signs of depression, 34% showed signs of anxiety, and again, 34% showed signs of post-traumatic symptoms. Post-traumatic fatigue, impaired memory, um, did appear to be present nearly up to a year um, from recovery. And also there was evidence of disexecutive syndrome in around a third of cases with COVID-19. So disexecutive syndrome is where you have cognitive difficulties, whether it's just around concentration or emotional changes as well as personality changes. So there's numerous factors that could have an impact on neuropsychiatric as well as psychiatric presentations. One is about viral load. Um, one is around the susceptibility of their, of their brain. So if they had pre-existing cerebrovascular disease, they may be more prone to have delirium or uh, a heightened state of confusion uh, for much longer. Uh, physiological compromise, immune response, uh, responses, which may be different for various reasons, um, but other social, um, social, social factors such as isolation uh, are also key to logical factors. Isolation may mean that when the points where you actually went to uh, obtain help perhaps was too late. And because of the fact that you were isolated, there were other factors, whether it's around hydration, nutrition, uh, as well as um, your own uh, mental health when negatively impacted. We have to be mindful about some of these studies because there are uh, numerous studies out there, but there is no systematic neuropsychological measure. Uh, and of course, uh, we're, we're still in 2020. Um, we're still probably around six months from the point that things became apparent. So there is no uh, long-term consequences uh, that we can um, focus on. But we do know SARS and MERS happened. Uh, and there are some similarities in terms of the, uh, the actual structure of the virus. The other uh, limitation is that non-English samples were excluded uh, and we couldn't really compare the before and after, which would be very important for, for such uh, commentary. This is more of an observational study. So this is specifically looking at China um, because they appear to be um, ahead of the curve uh, in the sense that it, uh, they had such difficulties and they uh, did a lot of population-based studies. Uh, you can see that around 16, 17% suffered with moderate depression um, and anxiety was also more prominent, uh, coming up to 30%. Traumatization was also higher in public than frontline staff, which is quite interesting. Um, so, so this is around um, increased levels of anxiety, uh, increased uh, levels of trauma and worry because of what they may encounter. So Shigemura uh, did also talk about the economic impact on well-being, fear stockpiling. Uh, I know that this was present in the UK. This was all, um, I'm pretty certain this was also present in other parts of the, uh, other parts of the world. Um, but also has, uh, but also we need to think about high risk of adverse mental health outcomes for those with COVID-19, their families, as well as pre-existing uh, problems. The BMA, the, the British Medical Association, did a survey of 6,000 doctors and 44% reported anxiety, depression or burnout. And we do know one in five people from uh, ICU that get discharged suffer from PTSD. 
So PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder where there's um, a hypervigilance or increased levels of activity, uh, anxiety or uh, flashbacks, for example. But we also know that those who are deemed to be clinically stable also suffer from PTSD. So mental health problems uh, don't have any boundaries. They can affect anyone and everyone. Um, critical care, there's a high representation of VME uh, individuals and also 31% of deaths uh, are attributed to such groups. So there's lots of issues, redeployment, worry about putting uh, family and colleagues at risk, but there's greater concern around those living in care homes, domestic violence, as well as those suffering from substance misuse, uh, where there's increasing episodes of alcohol withdrawal, for example, and using other recreational drugs to compensate. We have to think about how do we optimize this is a quick slide. I know I'm... Okay, we'll do. Um, so I guess, well, let's focus on the general population. Understand that there's no boundaries. It can affect anyone. Avoid labeling, but also get the facts right. Do not focus on hearsay. Be neighborly. There's a, uh, there's a lot of evidence to say that there's increasing um, evidence of community cohesion, as well as uh, bring hope. Um, so this is the challenge. We have to prevent increased mental disorder, protect those, but also moving forward, uh, we have to establish good research methods as well as making sure organizations where we all work in look after each other. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zabed. Very nice uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to invite our fourth speaker, Dr. Nayar Imam. Dr. Nayar Imam is a chairman and CEO of the First Medicine Corporation and is responsible for the company's direction, including the forming strategic relationship and acquisition. A pioneer in the field of telemedicine, he served as the chairman and founder of American Radiology, which merged with the Nightmark and went public in 2006. Dr. Imam is the last academic post, was as an assistant professor in radiology at John Hopkins Medical Institution. Dr. Imam is also principal author of Breaking Down COVID-19, a living test book, which will be released in July 2020. He's going to talk about the practical radiology for COVID-19. Please welcome Dr. Imam. Dr. Nayar Imam. Hi, Dr. Imam. Hi, guys. Let me get the video and everything here. One second. And we'll do the share screen here. Hi, Dr. Nayar Imam. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to share the screen here. One second. Please share your screen, sir. Yeah, hold on. Okay, that's sharing. Hold on a second. The green icon at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Just click on that. One second. Yeah. Is it doing it or not? Oh, it's like I want to like window to share. Please look at the bottom of your screen. It says share screen. I think it's a green green icon. Yeah, there you are. No, it's Thank okay. You. Okay, one second. Let me see. Let me get. Doctor, now you put on the slide. Slide. Yes. Yes, I'm going to do it right now, and. All right. Are you able to see that? Yeah, it is okay. But okay. All right, so you're able to see the main slide, right? Okay. So, um, gentlemen, thank you. I'm Dr. Imam. I'm going to just talk about the practical radiology for COVID-19. And um, what I will do is try to make things simple uh, in the interest of time. I just want to leave people with some pearls. So talk about the more common findings in chest X-ray and CT. And when should we order chest X-ray uh, or CT? Um, and should CT be used for screening 
Um, I won't even uh, touch on ultrasound and MRI. There are other modalities that are being used. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to mention that ultrasound is being used by ER physicians. And there's a role for MRI uh, with cytokine storms um, and other areas related acute necrotizing encephalitis. But we're going to focus on chest x-rays and CT. Um, so with COVID... Uh, Dr. Uh, Nair, uh, sorry to interrupt. Can you please put it on the slideshow, please? The slideshow. If you can pick on the button, slideshow. Yeah, it is. It's not, what, are you, what are you seeing? You're not seeing the... Uh, hold on. You may be... Or hold on. It's, it's on the right, right on the top, top panel. Click on slideshow. Yeah, that's what, that's what it is on. Um, hold on, hold on, from. You can say from the beginning, click on the from the beginning. Yeah, okay. Can I get the beginning uh, slideshow yeah. beginning? Is that, is that showing that screen? Mm -hmm. How do I get uh, that? All right, hold on one second. Let me see what I can do, hold on. Can I? The icon is there. Slide but it's not doing it on this page. Wait, all right, okay, let me see, hold on, I have. Yeah, if I, it is a problem, then please go on, no yeah, problem. Yeah, please go no, in. what I'm gonna do is, um, I have two monitors, that's the problem here, one second. It's okay, so, so go, ahead, go ahead. All right, let me, all right. Um, all right, all right, so I'll begin over here, so. Uh, with regards to um, with changes in, in, in uh, COVID-19, um, just to get an idea that as, as we began seeing patients just three months ago, things changed. This was a patient on a skull and it was red as foreign body. This is just a patient with a mask, as you can see. So we've had to rethink how we look at things, all right? Um, with uh, COVID-19, we had a 20-year history of understanding coronavirus. So we've looked at data with MARS, SARS, and COVID-19, and there are a lot of similarities between them, uh, particularly that, you know, it's a ground glass appearance, peripheral, I'll get into that, but there's a lot of data discriminating these three diseases where they're similar, where they're different. In the chest x-ray, what do we see that uh, with uh, some major studies that have come out that consolidation occurs in about 50% of the patient, ground glass of pacification in about a third, peripheral zone for, uh, 40%, lower lung 50%, bilateral 50%, and pleural fusion 3%. So here's some examples of ground glass of pacification. I've got both the chest x-ray and corresponding CT reconstruction. Uh, because they can be harder to see on chest x-ray. In this case, you can see a hazy density in the right upper lobe, um, which early on was, uh, it can be tough to see. Uh, with the CT correlating, you can see what that looks like, classic ground glass opacification. Here's another case with more of a patchy peripheral mid to lower lung, gra uh, lung ground glass opacification. On the corresponding CT, you're able to see the uh, findings better, but that's what it, it's not airspace, it's in the interstitium. A easier pattern to see is a reticular nodular pattern on x-ray here in the left lung base and corresponding to the CT, you see there's, a, there's additional ground glass opacification along with the reticular nodular opacification. Here's an area of multifocal ill-defined ground glass opacities. This is sort of the hallmark of uh, this disease. When you tend to see this in, in a patchy multifocal area uh, in this uh, time period, although it's not unique to this virus, um, it, is, uh, it is very common with it. Bilateral lower con low consolidation is also very common. You can see here uh, going from uh, mild to moderate. Unilateral involvement is less common and um, you know, it's more typical of a bacterial pneumonia. Viral typically tends to be multiple. Another example of a peripheral airspace opacification, um, again, ground glass and peripheral is more common. 
in later stages, you get into diffuse airspace disease uh, leading up to ARDS. And again, here's on the chest X-ray and correlating with CT. Uh, and this, you know, this looks uh, like, uh, you know, garden variety ARDS, hard to differentiate from uh, many other findings. And again, progression of the disease uh, can have the same patient here up to three weeks, day four, day six, day 11. Some patients can have a very rapid progression in as much as just a few days. So it's very variable. Why some patients take more uh, time and others such a rapid course um, it's still being worked out, but it certainly has to do with other risk factors. Rare and uncommon conditions include uh, proliffusion uh, and pneumothoraces. So if you see these, these are much less, uh, these are less likely. Okay. Um, I'll talk about uh, some additional considerations uh, as a number of studies have shown that early on chest X-ray in early disease uh, is normal in up to 50% of the cases, in mild and mild in about 40%. So 90% of the cases presenting to urgent care are gonna have very mild or almost normal study. Uh, another study showed in the hospital patients that uh, chest X-ray may be used to predict. Uh, they broke the uh, lungs into uh, six zones, three on the right, three on the left, and they showed that if disease was present in two zones, those patients ended up being hospitalized. If they were present in three zones, there was a very high incidence of intubation. So that's something to, to keep in mind, that if you have early on um, multiple zones, that patient uh, can harbor more serious disease. Uh, we'll move on to CT. Um, CT findings of coronavirus, a uh, large study in radiology, uh, broke it down into early, early, intermediate, and late findings. Uh, again, up to 50% of the patients early on were normal. So that's one of the things that early on with a chest X-ray or CT, you have a very high percentage of people who are normal. And we'll get into, uh, you may have heard, um, you know, the studies in China where they begin to use the screening, and we're going to touch that, you know, in a moment as to why uh, and when that may be considered. Um, bilateral, 30% early, 75% in the intermediate time period, and 90% late. And early was two days, intermediate three to five days, late six to 12 days. So as you progress, there's progressive bilateral, more peripheral disease. And the hallmarks, again, are bilateral and peripheral, ground glass, consolidative opacities. I'll give them some examples of that. With longer time, CT findings become more uh, frequently include consolidation, uh, bilateral, peripheral, greater lung involvement, uh, as with ARDS. And there are a couple of interesting patterns, one called crazy paving pattern and reverse halo sign that you may see. I'll give examples of that. So this is the classic hallmark. You'll see uh, bilateral, peripheral, ground glass opacification uh, in lungs. And again, this is different from an airspace disease where uh, you have air bronchograms going into it. This is interstitial. And um, you know, later on, it'll become uh, consolidative interstitial. This is an example of a crazy paving pattern. You have thickened interlobular septae along with uh, uh, ground glass. It kind of looks, looks like a paved road. You may see with the cobblestones and that's where it gets the name from. Again, it's not specific to COVID-19, but given a uh, pretest probability, uh, it becomes uh, higher uh, sensitivity for the disease uh, in, in the current environment. So this is the crazy paving pattern. Another sign is what's called a reverse halo sign, where you've got a, almost like an ill-defined border with central area of lucency. This is also seen in, uh, in a number of conditions but certainly with COVID-19 as well. So the common findings are ground glass opacification, bilateral, subpleural, peripheral, airspace consolidation, particularly in the bases, and bronchovascular thickening. And the discriminatory findings, peripheral distribution, look for 
uh, multiple ground glass of pacification, particularly in the periphery, the bronchovascular thickening, interlobular septic thickening, uh, crazy paving pattern, and reverse halo sign. Again, these things progress over time. As the disease progresses, it moves more into a typical consolidation, uh, consolidation and ARDS appearance. So the stage of the disease is important, early, intermediate, and late. Now, screening by CT, there has been a lot of uh, debate, uh, early issues uh, that came up about whether CT can be used for screening uh, or not, and, and the risks and benefits. The meta-analysis has shown that uh, CT can have a sensitivity of 94% and 37%. Now, positive predictive value, and I think Dr. Jad Ahmed was touching on this, you know, you have, when you're looking at any test, you really have to understand what the underlying prevalence of the disease is to interpret that test. A positive predictive value is true positive over true positive plus false positive. So in an area we have low prevalence, um, the, the, the positive predictive value of the, of the test can be very low. And in fact, uh, in those settings, it's been shown that CT is not very good compared to uh, PCR I know some of the early ch Chinese data were suggesting that it can be used. And that's based on the findings that if the PCR is negative and you've got um, good clinical indicators, CT may show, uh, and chest X-ray may show the disease earlier, even if the PCR is negative. Some of that, again, may have to do with a false negative PCR examination. But nevertheless, the general consensus is that uh, CT should not be used as a diagnostic, as a screening tool. And in fact, uh, the Fleischner Society has recommended that it should, it should not be indicated uh, for other conditions other than disease progression, um, if in, indicated when there's worsening respiratory status. And in a resource constrained environment, um, it can be indicated as they were doing in, in China at that time with medical triage when the uh, PCR wasn't as good in the beginning and, or uh, available. So it really, you have to understand what the, what the baseline area is going on, what your resources are uh, when, you, when you take a look at some of these additional tools. Other concerns with CT is that it can deplete uh, PPE resources. Again, if you're use, using indiscriminatory, so you don't want to use it uh, if you don't need it. Uh, there's increased risk of viral transmission. And of course, there's unnecessary uh, ionizing radiation. So, that's the, uh, the, the basic um, uh, issue here is that, you know, when, when it comes to imaging and CT, um, we should, it's not, it, we should use it when we need it, and it is not your know, first line of uh, uh, screening. So with that, uh, I can take questions from one more lecture here. Okay. So that's the end of the uh, end of my talk. I may have uh, ended a bit soon. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Nayar Ahmad. Very nice presentation, sir. We have a lot of questions for you. We will discuss at the end of the meeting. Now I am going to invite our final speaker, Doctor Sayyad Reza. Doctor Sayyad Reza is a consultant cardiologist and head of the Department of Medicine, Al Awali Hospital, Bahrain. He is regional co coordinator for medical education for Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh trainer and examiner for Royal College of Physician, UK. He is also on the committee of acute cardiovascular care, heart, heart failure, and cardiovascular imaging, European Society of Cardiology. He is going to talk about the COVID-19 and heart. What do we know so far? Dr. Sayyad Raza. Hi, sir. You are muted, sir. Please. You're... You muted yourself. Yes, I'm audible now. Yeah, no. now it is okay. Yeah. So thank you very much for the very kind introduction. In the next 15 minutes, I'm just going to give you an overview as to how heart is involved in COVID-19. I'm going to briefly discuss and shed some light on pathophysiology. And then I would discuss on the management strategies and then finish with some key learning points.
One sec. My slides have frozen for some reason. Dr. Raza, just click on the slide set itself rather than clicking the next slide. Instead of clicking on the arrow okay. button, yeah. Okay, that's fine. So yes. these were the initial days when we were seeing the spread of the coronavirus and it spread to many countries rapidly and, and eventually causing a pandemic. Now, we all knew from the very beginning that lung was the major organ that was bearing the major brunt of this COVID-19. But very soon it was also understood that heart indeed was in the heart of this COVID crisis as well. Now, these were some of the studies that started to flood mainly from China. And these were based on small studies. Uh, these papers mainly were published in February and March uh, this year and that showed a distinct but definite link of COVID-19 with cardiovascular system. Large scale epidemiological studies from again from China showed that people who had high, who had cardiovascular disease had a higher mortality compared to those who did not have any comorbid conditions. And as you can see here, the figure 10.5% versus 0.9%. So that figure really tells us the scale of the problem. If you had cardiovascular disease, then there were very high chance of dying. Now, this was further confirmed with data from WHO that showed that people who had cardiovascular disease did indeed have quite a high mortality. Now, this is an interesting observation that was made. And this was from four provinces in Lombardy, uh, in Italy. And if I can draw your attention to the top panel where you can see, and you can just follow the red line. Uh, this was the period when the uh, SARS coronavirus 2 increased in number, the COVID-19 cases increased. Uh, this was mainly between February 20th till the end of March. And interestingly, what it was also found that there were more out of hospital cardiac arrests that took place in a similar period of time. So that again showed that there was some link of COVID-19 with cardiovascular disease. Now the pathophysiology as to how heart is involved or the how cardiovascular system is involved in COVID-19 is complex, it's multifactorial, but it is very well simplified on a single slide here. Now, heart is involved directly as well as indirectly. And the commonest way that heart is affected is through secondary hypoxia. And as you all know, the lung is the commonest organ that bears the brunt. There is pneumonia, and this is followed by ARDS, and that leads to significant hypoxemia. And this can indeed lead to hypoxia-related cardiac injury. Now, the less or the least common way that the heart can be affected is by direct attack of the virus on the heart muscle. And it causes an inflammation on the heart muscle or the myocardium, and that is what we call myocarditis. Now, myocarditis can have a varied presentation. It can be subclinical, patient may be asymptomatic, and on the other end of the spectrum, the patient may be very, very unwell. And this is what we call the fulminant myocarditis, where there will be acute decompensation, there will be heart failure, and there can also be malignant arrhythmia leading to cardiac arrest and death of the patients. Now we all know, and this has already been discussed, that COVID-19 infection in the third phase or the third stage leads to systemic hyperinflammation or what we call the cytokine storm. Now it does again affect the heart in several ways. Now there are a lot of inflammatory markers that are floating around in the circulation and this can have a significant effect on the cardiovascular instability. There is vasodilatation, and eventually this would lead to cardiogenic shock. The systemic hyperinflammation also causes the rupture of the vulnerable plaque or the atherosclerotic plaque leading to acute coronary syndrome, which includes non-ST segment elevated MI and ST segment elevated MI. The systemic hyperinflammation also causes macrovascular thrombosis that can occlude the coronary arteries, and it can give rise to acute coronary syndrome-like picture. So what is myocardial injury? So we essentially depend on a few of these parameters, as you can see here on the slide, 
there has got to be rise in the levels of the cardiac biomarkers, which is troponin. And also, we also see a rise of BNP and anti-proBNP. You would expect some changes on the ECG, and this may be in the form of T-wave inversion or T-wave changes, ST segment depression mainly, and occasionally we'll also see ST segment elevation. You would expect to see some changes on the echocardiogram, particularly looking at the left ventricular function, and this may be regional or global, depending on the, on the patient's presentation. Now, this is a slide that has been devised by myself. You'll not find this any, in any textbook. But uh, this is just to highlight that I'm sure there are a lot of people who are working in acute care areas. They would come across troponin rise. Now, troponin rise, let me tell you, does not equate to myocardial infarction. So there is a long list of causes where troponin can indeed go up. And we cardiologists are very, well, very often consulted just on this, that why this troponin is high. Now, if I ask you, what are the two top differential diagnoses that you should keep in mind? Yes, so it, should, it is myocardial infarction and myocarditis because they both have higher mortality. At the same time, they are managed very differently. Now, then if you may ask, what is the definitive diagnosis of myocarditis? Then it is endomyocardial biopsy. And to make a definitive diagnosis as to underlying cause of acute coronary syndrome, then you must do catheter coronary angiogram. Cardiac MRI also helps. And as you can see in the picture, moving picture on the right of the cardiac MRI, and that shows a late gadolinium enhancement in the mid wall of the left ventricle. Sometimes it's also epicardial, but in myocardial infarction, it is often subendocardial, late gadolinium enhancement. Now again, this is difficult to get in a sick patient who is COVID-19 lying on ICU bed, or I would say it is next to impossible to get these investigation. So what you're going to rely on mainly on two things. One is your basic assessment where you go back to history and examination. And secondly, it is your own clinical judgment. So that is again, very, very important to keep in mind. Now, we all came to learn very soon that COVID-19 mainly affected the older patients who are above the age of 60 or 65. These are the patients who had other comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, obesity, but it also came to light very soon. And these reports started to come out from China and that showed that even young individuals in their 20s, 30s, or early 40s, they were dying and they were having severe COVID-19 and they were dying suddenly. So this again raised a question as to why young and healthy patients were dying of COVID-19. Now, if you can see on the left, left-hand panel of your screen. This is a list I've made myself just to show as to what can be the possible causes. And this, I've, I've compiled this, this list from the, uh, from the literature I've read through on this subject. On the right-hand panel, you'll see I've mentioned acute fulminant myocarditis. Now SARS coronavirus 2 does not differentiate between male or female, does not differentiate between the racial backgrounds, but for some reason, it has got a liking for young hearts. Now, we don't know the reason why so, but it does affect the young hearts. And once it causes an inflammation in the heart muscle, it does lead to severe decompensation of the cardiac muscle in within no span of time. It takes just days or weeks, and the patient deteriorates very rapidly. This in turn would lead to acute heart failure, and it also predisposes to malignant arrhythmia like ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. And that is the primary reason why these patients may die suddenly. We all have heard so far that this is an acute inflammatory condition. So it also stimulates or also accelerates the prothrombotic activity. It stimulates the coagulant factors. And this would again give rise to thrombosis in the coronary arteries, thrombosis in the uh, in the cerebrovascular tree, and that can lead to serious or severe uh, ischemic strokes that may be even fatal in these young individuals. And certainly it can also lead to fatal pulmonary, pulmonary embolism in these young individuals. Concerns were raised about the ARB and ACE inhibitors. Again, this probably has been covered a little bit, but the fact is that, as you all know, the, there are spike proteins on the surface of the coronavirus and they have got a liking 
to bind with these ACE2 receptors, which are in abundance on the surface of the lungs. And what these ACE2 does is that it allows the virus an entry into the lung, increase the replication and cause infectivity. So that was the concern that was being raised and a lot of patients were actually apprehensive to take or continue these, these medications. Now, thankfully enough, very soon, we came to know that ACE2 in fact can be beneficial to the heart. And as you can see in the lower panel, ACE2 helps to convert the angiotensin 2. If you can see my cursor here, it helps to convert the angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1 to 7. Now, angiotensin 1 to 7 is actually beneficial because of its vasodilatory property. It has got antifibrotic property. So with that, European Society of Cardiology issued a position statement that these patients should continue on the ACE inhibitor angiotensin, angiotensin 2 receptor blockers. And this was similar guidelines were issued again from American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, and Heart Failure Society of America. Now, hydroxychloroquine, as you all know, has been the most controversial molecule during this pandemic. And when it is combined with azithromycin, which is a macrolide antibiotic, it leads to prolongation of QT interval. Now, what is QT interval? I've, I'm showing it on the ECG here. It's an interval between the start of the Q wave to the end of the T wave. And essentially, it depicts the myocardial depolarization and repolarization. Now, this can be prolonged in a lot of situations, but drugs like these are commonly known to prolong, and if they are combined together, then this prolongation is much higher. Now, the normal corrected QT interval is 440 milliseconds in male and 460 milliseconds in female. Now, when this prolongs to more than 500 milliseconds, it does pose a threat for what we call torsar de point, and, also, and that essentially is a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia that you can see in the bottom of the slide here. This can progress to ventricular fibrillation, cause cardiac arrest, and eventually death of a person. Cardiac management in COVID-19 essentially is supportive. It is a prothrombotic condition, so there's a lot of, lot of use of anticoagulants. Even the DOACs, which is the direct oral anticoagulants, are being used, but they do have some some uh, interference or they may have, when they are combined with antiviral, then, then they probably they should not be used. The RAS inhibitors and the other medication that these patients may be on should be continued if these patients are in stable condition. Arrhythmia is a very common problem. You can get ventricular or atrial arrhythmias. These could be tachyarrhythmias and bradyarrhythmias. And more so when these patients are in ICU because they've got hypoxia, significant hypoxia, a chloride imbalance, these patients may be on inotropes. So they are susceptible to develop these arrhythmias. When the patients do have a cardiopulmonary collapse, first you've got to manage with the invasive ventilation. But if that fails, then, then you have got to go for ECMO, which is extracorporeal membrane oxygen therapy or intra-aortic balloon pump. I do not have the time to go through this, but uh, I've just mentioned it here. The management strategy of, of how different patient, patients are managed with acute cardiomyopathy, heart failure, and so on, has again changed, and there are different guidelines from different societies. Now, when it comes to managing non-ST segment elevated MI, which is a part of the acute coronary syndrome, if they are high risk or very high risk, then only we adopt an invasive strategy but the rest of the patients, they should be managed in a conservative manner. Now, how about ST segment elevated MI? So ST segment elevated MI, if there is a center which can provide 24 seven cath lab service, then these patients may undergo primary PCI. If they do not have that provision, then if they can transfer the, the patient to a center which can provide the primary PCI within a stipulated time, allowing just extra 60 minutes uh, for this pandemic, the COVID pandemic, then these patients may be transferred. Apart from these patients, all the patients should be managed conservatively and they should be given thrombolytic therapy and they may not have primary PCI. So I'll finish with just the key learning points. So cardiovascular system, as you all know, 
is involved in COVID patients, it's real. And it does lead to increase in mortality. And some patients, it also leads to sudden death. The pathophysiology, which I've illustrated, is multifactorial and complex, but we are trying to understand. And treatment is mainly supportive. And indeed, COVID-19 has brought about a significant change as to how cardiology is practiced. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sayyad Raza. Very nice, very, very, very good presentation, sir. You, uh, I have a lot of questions which you already answered by your presentation. But uh, yes, this is true that in the early days of the COVID, uh, it, when we know very less about it, that time it, uh, a lot of patients present with uh, acute coronary syndrome. Thank you. Anyway, anyway, thank you, sir. Thank you. Now we have finished our first session. Now we have the floor. So anybody who want to ask question, please add the answer. We will go. I receive a lot of questions, sir. So I will uh, go by one by one. But I have a lot of questions. So maybe I'm not able to give. As I will, uh, I will put on the question. But important, what the important question is there that I would like to read for you. It is okay? Yeah, go on, please. The first question is coming from Dr. Sayyid Arshad. Is there cor corona pandemic is beneficial to take co co screen 150 daily, especially those who have the hypertension or diabetes? This is, I think, uh, Dr. Sayyid Arshad. For you, yeah, sir. okay. So obviously, you know, this is a altogether different group of patients and uh, now it does not particularly apply to COVID-19 patients. Now, with regards to aspirin, obviously we must first of all understand it's an antiplatelet drug. And more recently, there are studies that is showing that aspirin, it is a dangerous drug. Now it has to be used carefully. It's not a pill, you know, or, or, or a candy that can be given to anybody. So you must very carefully select your patients assess the cardiovascular risk and then only take the aspirin. Now with regards to COVID patients as a preventive measure, I don't think there is any evidence and I have not read of any study that actually would recommend using aspirin. Thank you, sir. There is a second question is coming from their uh, Dr. Farhat to everyone, all the panelists. I see that there is a who's a spike in people going after antibacterial hand shop bus, sanitizer, etc. Will that actually help in killing germs more than the regular shops? This is this question for all the panelists. I think um, Dr. Riaz, I tried to answer that in the chat itself. Yes. The fact of the matter is we are trying to rely on the alcohol component of any of the sanitizers to actually form a biofilm around the virus, thereby preventing the spread. So any, anything for that matter, soap or alcohol gel, that's the basic principle, as opposed to just using uh, just water on its own. Then the question for Dr. Sayyad Reza, the cardiac involvement can manifest how early on high, high late in the disease cycle? Can arrhythmia arise around the days 13 or 14? after RT-PCR detection in a person who otherwise had very mild symptom. This question came from Naila Bey Ansari to everyone. I think uh, Dr. Sayyad Reza, you, you... Yeah, I think uh, that's actually a very good question and a lot of people are actually asking a similar question. Uh, now, it is very difficult to say as to how many days. Now, the cardiac involvement, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, it can be varied. Now, it depends on what we are talking and what the cl clinical scenario is going to be. Now, as I have said, the pathophysiology is very complex. The heart is involved in different manner. It can be a direct involvement causing uh, myocarditis. It can be secondary to severe hypoxemia and a lot of other things. So it really depends on the clinical scenario. So I wouldn't put a date or a time frame here. Uh... Thank you, sir. One more question for you, sir. Okay. This, uh, this is uh, this question from Dr. Rabia, Rabia Salman. 
She is asking. Yeah, please go on. Lately, over the last ten days, we encounter many people dying suddenly due to heart attack. Could it be linked to COVID nineteen in asym asymptomatic cases? Okay, so that's a <laughs> a, a, a very long long answer. It, it can be a very short answer to that. Now the heart attack involvement, uh, as I said, that it you, you know it may not be entirely related to COVID. Now COVID per se uh, to cause heart attack, it's in a very very small uh, number of patients who will have heart attack directly to COVID. So heart attacks we are still seeing they are not COVID related. So the brief answer would be that the chances that COVID itself will cause heart attack is very small. But yes, as I've said that pathophysiology, as we understand by now, that there is systemic inflammation and that can trigger to, or cause a rupture of the atherosclerotic plaque. And secondly, the, the thrombosis, uh, in hyperinflammation leading to thrombosis in the coronary vessels, that can again, is another way, it can cause acute coronary syndrome. But per se, the COVID-19 itself is not the, is not the uh, trigger to cause heart attack. Okay. Uh, I'd, just like, I'd just like to add to that, that um, we have to think about the psychology behind some of these cases, because I think people are scared. Uh, people are scared to actually seek help, and sometimes they may actually present too late to uh, receive life-saving treatment. So it could be very well not related to COVID, but the fact that they actually haven't sought help earlier, uh, I think, uh, may be responsible for, su for such cases. No, I think, uh, as you said, Dr. Mehran, uh, Dr. Javid, now it is uh, being recognized that a lot of patients uh, who are known to have cardiovascular disease, uh, having had previous myocardial infarction, previous uh, bypass surgery, primary PCI, uh, are uh, patients of advanced heart failure. Now, due to fear of coming to the hospital, uh, due to fear that they may, may catch the infection, they are staying at home. And, at the, and, and also what they're doing is that they are keeping their uh, symptoms uh, to themselves. So obviously they are not uh, coming to the hospital. And there are, there are no, it is being found that these patients, some of them are coming at a very late stage and some of them, they also prefer to die at home. So that's a very sad state of affairs, unfortunately. One more question for Dr. Sayyad Raza. Uh, he already answered this question, but uh, I have seen a lot of people asking this question. Are patients who are currently on AC inhibitor or ARB at increased risk of acquiring SARS or COVID? Yes. Uh, no, this was the initial fear that the patients who are on AC inhibitors or ARB drugs, uh, they may be at increased risk. And this was a debate that went on for some time. And then we came to learn that uh, the ACE2, in fact, is beneficial. And as I've showed in my slide, that it helps to convert the angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1 to 7, which is uh, actually protective for the heart and the cardiovascular system as a whole. So then it, it came as a recommendation from a lot of societies that they are safe to use. And in fact, they should not be discontinued in patients who are already on. As let me add again that this is a very common drug, ACE inhibitor and angiotensin receptor blocker. We give this for hypertension. There are millions of patients around the world on these medications. The patients with heart failure, patients with chronic kidney disease. So there are patients, lots and lots of patients on these drugs. So uh, thankfully enough, uh, this, the, the benefic beneficial effects came to light and the recommendation is just they should not be stopped. They should be continued if the patients are stable. Can I just take an opportunity to actually ask a couple of questions, if that's okay with uh, Riaz? If that's yes, okay. Yeah. Yes, One yes. question is to Dr. Mehran Javed, and the other question is to Dr. Nayar Imam. Uh, first of all, to uh, Dr. Javed, you know, when we have so many drugs that are quite um, kind of significant cardiac effects um, in terms of COVID treatments, do you have any experience or have you seen any patients with you know underlying psychiatric problems who are also on quite a few drugs that have cardiac side effects have you seen any interactions 
the second question is, whilst you have a think, uh, Mehran, I wanted to just check if uh, Nayar Imam could shed some light on what is the radiological follow-up guidelines that you're using? Is there any radiological follow-up guidelines at all uh, locally in uh, US? Because we have some guidelines in terms of BTS, but it'd be nice to have some experience and you know, radiological um, uh, insight into it, if that's okay. So Mehran, if that's okay, if you want to answer yours first. Unmute yourself, Mehran. Dr. Yes. Oh, yes yeah. um, um, thank you for the question, uh, Dr. Mehdi. So um, the issue about cardiotoxicity uh, and medication, as, you, as you're aware, uh, psychotropics can have, it, uh, can have a negative effect on uh, cardiac profile. The, the key is that before you start someone on such medications, they have at least an ECG or an appraisal of their cardiac health. Um, Ongoing difficulties as well uh, when they have COVID, for example, uh, it becomes much more difficult to appraise because a, a lot of them are in care homes. Uh, and when cases such as that emerge, uh, they are automatically in lockdown or restrict um, uh, such, such cases. And if the, um, the physical health starts to uh, take over in the sense that the, that needs increased amount of attention, more often than not, they will be admitted to hospital. Um, so I think a lot of the a lot of the interactions or the opportunities for psychiatrists is, is limited. Um, we can sometimes go off through changes in heart rate, uh, as well as postural changes uh, in terms of what what the next step needs to be. So I think that it needs to be something that needs to be discussed on a regular basis with physicians, whether it's a geriatrician or the general practitioner uh, looking after the patient. But unfortunately, a lot of the cases do end up going to hospital. Can I add to that uh, something, if I may, and Dr. Riaz? Yeah, I have one more so, question. So these, these, these uh, psychiatric, uh, you know, the, the drugs, uh, mainly the antidepressants and the antipsychotics, we all know that they do increase the QT interval. And it is the corrected QT, QT interval. Sometimes they should be very closely monitored in some of these antipsychotics and antidepressants. And particularly in patients who are uh, COVID-19, because we know these are some sick patients. If they are particularly in high dependency unit or ICU, so they will have a lot of electrolyte imbalance, uh, biochemical changes, acid base disturbances. So the substrate is already there to cause this prolongation of QT. And on top of that, if you start them on hydroxychloroquine or give them azithromycin, and they are already on antidepressants or the antipsychotics, then you can imagine you know, where the QT is going to go. So these will be the, we, will be the very high risk patients to see. Dr. Sayyid Raja, there is a myth is going on. Internists are blaming cardiologists. They are not allowing us to treat the COVID patient. They are making us a lot of restriction. No, I don't think that's <laughs> it's, it's that way. <laughs> Uh, there is a uh, uh, this question. Uh, this is not question, but uh, this is one uh, uh, Dr. Yes. from uh, Doctor uh, Doctor Farooq. He is the batchmate of Doctor uh, Ezaz. He is uh, giving him greetings, and uh, he is telling thank you very much. And Doctor Dr. Yes. yes, I had a question for Doctor Nayar Imam. If you can allow him to answer. Yes, please, please go ahead. Can you explain the? Uh, I got the question, question uh, Doctor Imam. Yeah, what exactly is the question about the guidelines? So, you know, when we have uh, radiological changes on the CT scan, consistent with ground glass changes or consistent with COVID changes, uh, locally we have some guidelines about how to follow up uh, these patients uh, in terms of clinical but also radiological follow up. Is there any guidance as to what percentage of these patients with, you know, CT changes will end up with? long-term side effects, long-term complications in terms of radiological problems. Uh, do you have any local guidelines there? So, um, I think those are still being developed, but we know from the SARS-1 that um, there are a number of complications that occur, pulmonary fibrosis, and we're beginning to see some of the long-term complications. In fact, we've got a whole chapter dedicated to um, where that's going to be coming through. Uh, there's just a lot of uh, Beginning to see things, you know, throughout the body, um, you know, 
diabetes type one and other kinds of things that are happening on the endocrine side of the lung side, primarily pulmonary fibrosis that we're scarring of the lungs cannot, you know, cannot recover. So uh, I think those guidelines are still being developed. It's only been literally, you know, we've done so much in the world in three months, it seems like it's serious, but really it's only three months and the long-term ramifications of this disease are just beginning to be understood right now. Just, you know, we're just the tip of the iceberg for those. Thank you. I have one question for Dr. Nayar Imam. I can go ahead. Yes. Dr. Nayar, as you mentioned that in your presentation, we are not recommending to routine way to CT scan, but we have seen, as Dr. Azad mentioned in that, the ground, uh, the clinical manifestation is very, very. Some patients we are seeing, the symptoms uh, uh, showing that uh, the patient is suffering from uh, most public COVID, suspected uh, case of COVID, x is normal. In that cases, we physician as trying to go for the CT. And after second or third, uh, third time, we are, when we are repeating the, uh, this uh, PCR, we find positive. So how you are seeing this one, sir? So that's right. In up to 10% of the patients, um, you know, they found that uh, PCR could be negative and the CT will be ahead, if you will, of the PCR findings, right? And the question is, is that because it's a false negative and also some of the tests have been improving over the last, you know, three to four months. So the, the issue is that not, it's, it sh it's not that it shouldn't be done, but it shouldn't be done as a blanket screening examination instead of the PCR. And it's also dependent on the prevalence of the disease in the, as I was alluding to, you know, about the positive predictive value of the test. So yes, yeah, so in, in those settings and depending on the resources, it can be a very good supportive um, tool to do that. But we're not recommended doing it on everybody as uh, in lieu of that test. Sir, uh, still there is a question is coming. Can we take it or uh, because of lack of time, we can... Uh, this is question coming from Dr. Sayyid Reza. Should someone who has recovering from COVID-19 consider seeing a card cardiologist for a checkup? This is somebody who is recovering from COVID should see a cardiologist? After recovering. Um, and what could be the reasons for seeing the cardiologist? Yeah, for checkup. No, I think, uh, I mean, if there's a specific need, uh, if, if, you know, the patient, I'm, I'm not sure of the patient profile, but it all depends on the patient profile. It depends on the age of the patient, the comorbidities, uh, previous cardiac history, and symptoms which are, you know, suggestive of uh, cardiac condition, then yes, probably they do need to see. Uh, but uh, sometimes we do screening for patient, but this, this is a normal setting. I starting to do with COVID that, you know, COVID has caused or will cause some, some cardiac illness. So as a screening, if they suffer from COVID then recovered, I don't think there's any guideline. One more question for you, sir, Dr. Sayyid Reza. Sure. What data we have for giving the subcutaneous heparin for 28 days after discharge? What data? I think this is probably will be better answered by Dr. Bashar Mendi because I think he mentioned that protocol in his talk, talk, but I'll leave it for him to answer. If that's, that's okay. Yes, Dr. Basara. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. That's a good question because I did answer in the chat as well. Um, it is one of the pragmatic approaches that we have to take in these situations. Like, you know, we've all been learning through this pandemic. Uh, BTS guidelines, which is British Thoracic Society guidelines for VT in COVID recommends uh, at least four weeks of post-COVID prophylactic fragment. Now, there is no hard evidence for it. Of course, as I said, it's balancing the risk and the benefit of it. As you know, most of the COVID patients, even after recovering from the hospital, will still be quite breathless, will still be, uh, there'll be an element of immobility and lack of mobility when they go home. And that is when there is highest risk of developing the clots. So based on that, you know, and also keeping in mind the complications of giving any, um, you know, blood thinning medications, that is how we've come up with that protocol of four weeks post discharge to go on low molecular weight heparin. Um, as I said, it has to be very carefully, you know, in a very carefully selected group of patients and keeping in mind their social problems. There, there, there are a few papers that came out from our Italian colleagues 
And they have mentioned that the VT, in fact, uh, quite a lot of patients they have seen, they have been asymptomatic. And they started to actually scan all the patients, whether there was an indication or not. And they have seen uh, the incidence of VT up to 70%. So that's what they report. So it's a really high number. For Dr. Javed, for you, sir, what is the role of behavioral treatment for post-COVID? So, the, so I guess behavioral treatment could be in two different dimensions. One could be delirium management. Uh, there are lots of guidelines uh, that people can certainly refer to. Uh, we have to be mindful that um, delirium and uh, over time things should settle, but there can be increasing levels of agitation, fluctuation, sometimes even hallucinations. But we, uh, but we do know that episodes of psychosis, for example, in uh, COVID and post-COVID uh, period is very rare and it's probably related to steroid treatment uh, as opposed to uh, actual COVID-related uh, disease. Um, the other behavioral treatment, we always have to think about a non-pharmacological approaches. So if someone is elderly, they may have subsequent irreversible cerebrovascular damage. There could be a worsening of their cognition or dementia. Um, and because of that, we have to think about how do we maintain a safe environment? Uh, and if the environment becomes too risky or they become uh, too risky within that environment, then we have to think around um, the various medications that's there. So there are uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So these are common antidepressants. Uh, sometimes anxiolytics can be used, but again, these are uh, these should be used sparingly because of the uh, difficulty with dizziness as well as risk of falls and sedation. Um, and uh, antipsychotics, I would not really recommend the use of antipsychotics uh, just because of their toxicity as well as their dynamic nature. So there are some options there, but everything uh, should be done in a non-pharmacological method. If someone's quite uh, clean from a cardiac perspective, sometimes trazodone, which is an antidepressant, can be used. Uh, antipsychotics can certainly be used, but we have to think around the anticholinergic burden. So those medications that have a very least uh, effect, because you're, you're already um, uh, managing someone who's in a compromised situation, aren't you? From a cognitive perspective, you don't want to add further difficulty uh, with medications. So catiapine is certainly an option. There's aripiprazole, there's risperidone but everything has to be discussed in an open manner with the patient and the family because you're using a licensed medication for an uh, unlicensed indication, indication, if that makes sense. I would like to conclude it. Uh, I would like to thank you to the organizing committee and all of my panelists who is there. Thank you very much. I would like to turn it over to Dr. Sayyid Reza, who will give us the thanks. Please. Dr. Sayyid Reza, please. Thank you. Dr. Sayyid Raza. Thank you very much, first of all, Dr. Riaz, to, for being a wonderful moderator for this webinar. And I would like to thank all the participants, first of all, to attend this webinar uh, on the weekend. I realize it's quite late, in, particularly in India and Pakistan, and also in UAE, uh, for you as well, there, Dr. Riaz. Uh, so it was great to see you all. It was very good to interact with all, all of you. And thank you for putting all your questions through. If some questions have not been answered, my apologies. Uh, we can, you know, it can be answered. It will be in the chat box. If there's a way to contact, uh, we will we will try to see if those answer, if those questions could be answered. And last but not the least, I would like to extend my special thanks to all the speakers who who accepted my invitation. Uh, I would say on a fairly quite short notice. And thank you for your attendance and thank you very much for being here so late. Thank you.